So Mount Rainier is a volcano. Is that true? Yes, sir, it's true. I keep hearing it's an active volcano, like you so-called experts keep telling me that this is an active volcano. Is that true? Yes, sir, it is an active volcano. Well, I don't believe it. I don't buy it. I've lived here my whole life, and I don't believe that Mount Rainier is an active volcano. Okay, sir, what's your line of thinking here? Let's, 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 let's hear you out. Well, I've been, up, uh, I've been up on Rainier with my family. There's a bunch of snow up there. There's glacial ice up there, you know. If this is an active volcano, you'd think that ice would have gone away long ago. So, uh, why is there ice there if this is such an active volcano? Shouldn't there be magma inside of the mountain? Oh, okay, well, um, I can get into it, but I'm, here, I'm, I'm interested. What else do you have to say? Well, uh, you know, I live in Enumclaw, and I've, I'm going to have my 76th birthday here uh, coming up in August, and... Uh, I do my dishes every night, and I look out my kitchen window at the mountain there, Rainier, and uh, I've, I've never seen even a hint of steam come out of that mountain in 76 years. And uh, I keep hearing this stuff about this impending doom, and, and, and this, all this stuff is going to be happening, but that's, that's a member of my family up there, that Mount Rainier, and I, I, I just can't, I can't buy that anything's going to happen. In fact, my dad didn't see anything, and my grandpa, Enum Clyde, he, so we got, we got three generations that haven't seen a damn thing happen on top of that mountain. <laughs> so I don't think it's an active volcano. Okay. Well, you do have to go back to the 1800s. What's your name, by the way? I'm Jerry. Jerry from Enumclaw. Okay, Jerry. Jerry, you've you got to go back to the 1800s. In the back of the room, maybe you can't see this, but we've got some dates up here. 1894, 1884, etc., a bunch of eyewitness accounts of Mount Rainier doing little puffs of steam. Not eruptions, just little, little action up there at the summit, the summit craters. That's what this is. This is my artist rendition of, of little puffs of steam, little fumaroles. Thank you, thank you. So we've got what? Eight of these little eyewitness accounts scattered in newspapers. These are early settlers coming in. And of course, there's oral traditions of the mountain being very active. But we have to go back to 1820, 1820 to get the most recent actual ash deposit from Mount Rainier. And this is long before Jerry and his uh, grandparents and his parents seeing the mountain do something. Now I could take an approach with Jerry and I could say, look, the Mount Rainier is definitely an active volcano. We have a Cascade Volcano Observatory. We have a team of geologists who go up to this mountain regularly, and they're monitoring the mountain. And we have technology now. We have instrumentation. We have tilt meters that measure the slopes of the mountain, and those things are changing. We have seismic stations that are recording earthquakes, and there's a signature of those earthquakes that tell us that magma is moving on occasion in the mountain, below the mountain. Seismic noise, essentially, showing the magma moving. There's changing heat. There's heat flow measurements that change. There's gases that are changing in volumes of gases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But with Jerry, I don't know if that would really resonate. And really, this is two questions, isn't it? Is Mount Rainier a volcano, meaning has it ever erupted in the past? That's one discussion. I'm not sure where Jerry stands on that. And number two is, are we really talking about this happening again in the future? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to make a scenario. We're going to try to visualize what is possible for the next eruption of Mount Rainier and then go and find all this wonderful field evidence, actual rocks. We're going to get our hands dirty and our boots dirty and our feet wet as we go around this mountain, in the river valleys especially, to look for physical geologic evidence of this mountain erupting. And if you're getting impatient already, we have 55 lahars, 55 volcanic mud flows from Rainier in the last 10,000 years. 55 separate major events to produce 55 major deposits along the flanks or the floor of Mount Rainier. And if we go back to the history of Mount Rainier, which is half a million years worth of that mountain standing there, we certainly have thousands and thousands of eruptions of Mount Rainier. But again, we want to be able to show the evidence for that instead of just saying it, putting it in a pamphlet or in a newspaper article or whatever Jerry's uh, getting his hands on. Okay, so I've got a map of Washington. I have a cross-section of Mount Rainier, and I'd like to go back and forth just briefly, okay? 
So what's the first thing that pops to your mind when you think of Mount Rainier erupting? What's your first visual? Oh, you're timid. Okay, 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 fine. Well, it's, it's, not little, it's not little fumaroles. It's not little steam, probably. It's like, what are we thinking? Well, maybe we can think of Mount St. Helens and what happened in 1980, right? And that's probably a pretty decent living laboratory, a little modern example of what we can expect. And, uh, and, and that is what we want to do. So let's, <clears throat> let's have this beautiful, beautiful, scary, threatening plume of ash. Right? Coming out of a cone volcano. Just that's what we all remember from St. Helens in 1980. And if we have prevailing westerly winds, we're going to blow ash from this column downwind, and we're going to have that ash fall on the landscapes of eastern Washington. That's us, by the way, right? That's us in Ellensburg in the Hal Home Center. We're essentially due east of Mount Rainier. So this is Mount Rainier, here's Ellensburg, and sure, we can imagine this, this uh, blanket of ash being blown downwind the next time Rainier erupts, and more importantly, we have plenty of tephras, ash beds, uh, that we can find in eastern Washington that tell us when Rainier erupted multiple times in the past. Fine, it's more than ash though, and nobody's really, we don't have thousands of fatalities of ash falling out of the sky. Even if it's a bigger eruption than Mount St. Helens, we probably don't have fatalities in eastern Washington. Do we have something more threatening? We do. Up in the park itself. So now I'm just going to make Mount Rainier, and I'm going to make a box around Mount Rainier. What's that? That's the national park boundary. That's a convenient bar boundary for us. This is an old national park. People come from around the world to visit Mount Rainier, and they want to visit this national park. And who can blame them? It's an idyllic spot. It's perfect up there. Perfect. So are there hazardous things? Sure there are. There are lava flows that are really not going to leave the national park. There are lava flows that we can expect to come out of Mount Rainier, but they're stiff enough, they're sticky enough, the viscosity is high enough with these andesite lava flows to basically not leave the park, not go beyond very far the base of Mount Rainier. And the other hazard is more threatening than the lava flows, it's something called a pyroclastic flow, or an ash flow, or an ignimbrite. And those are these traveling, ground-hugging clouds of ash and gas that are moving much, much faster than lava flows. And again, my point is, I'm just going to fill up the National Park now, so we don't want to be in the park when this happens. But in Ellensburg, in Tacoma, in other residential places, in Enumclaw with Jerry, we don't have a loss of life. So if we play our cards right and we stay out of the park, we're probably okay right. No, we're not okay, because there is number four. There is one more hazard, and it's the topic tonight. What was the title of the lecture tonight? Mount Rainier's Osceola Mudflow. So what is a mudflow? That doesn't sound too dangerous. We're going to tramp through mud getting in here. I, I can handle a little bit of mud. This is more than a little bit of mud. So first of all, on a map... Who is at risk with these volcanic mud flows from Mount Rainier? And the answer is people living in the river valleys up to 60 miles away from Mount Rainier. So now we've got a daddy log legs here, right? On the map we've got a, a national park, but we have, now have these tentacles going out. These are the pathways of volcanic mud flows that have come from Mount Rainier. And again, there are 55 known, mapped, identified mud flows in the river valley surrounding Mount Rainier. So how does that work here? Are we just going to have mud? Why are we talking about mud? Why are we erupting mud? Don't volcanoes erupt lava? Here's the story. And I'm going to teach you, if you don't know this, specifically how to look at Rainier with a new set of eyes. We're going to look at a lot of photos and we're going to say, oh, I can see where the scar is. I can see where the mud flow came from. Which side am I on? i got to know which flank I'm on with Mount Rainier. Which, am I on the west side, north side? Oh, I can see it. You can see what? Well, the idea is you take Mount Rainier or you take any composite cone volcano in the world, and if you want to make a volcanic mud flow, here's what you do. You probably don't want to do this. It's harmful, but if we're doing it, we're doing it. We behead the mountain. Upper 1,000 feet, upper 1,500 feet, something in that range. 
This happened with St. Helens. It happened with Mount Rainier. With the Osceola mud flow. And we talked to a couple from uh, that area tonight. They drove over, somehow got over the pass on this winter night. And they said, yeah, well, we want to hear about the Osceola mud flow. So it's pronounced Osceola locally, but uh, us uh, folks who don't live in the area call it Osceola. Sorry about that. I'm calling Osceola. I got 25 years of calling it the Osceola. I can't reprogram myself now. Okay? So 5,600 years ago, 5,600 years ago is the precise date for this Osceola mud flow. There are 55 of these, but this is the granddaddy. This is the one that dwarfs the others as far as thickness and distance traveled and effect on the mountain. You can see the scar from this Osceola mud flow. Again, what are we talking about? We behead the mountain. Okay, I'm with you so far. The mountain is going to move. The mountain's going to move. We're going to take the andesite lavas, the tephra layers, the old pyroclastic flows. In other words, we're going to take the stuff inside of the mountain, including the glacial ice, including the lakes, including the streams, and we're going to mobilize, mobilize that head of Mount Rainier and have it flow. That's what a volcanic mud flow is. It's not mud coming out of an erupting volcano. It's the mountain itself in a landslide. And there's so much moisture, water content, that it converts into this liquid concrete. That's the common analogy. You go, you get some cement poured, you got a new sidewalk, and you've got this stuff coming out of a cement mixer. That's what we're talking about, the same uh, color, the same consistency. These mud flows are more rock than they are water, but they still can flow. We'll have video and some other things to look at in just a bit of these volcanic mud flows. In the case of the Osceola, 5,600 years ago, the Osceola mud flow made it to Tacoma, made it to Commencement Bay, dumped right into Puget Sound. And since that time, we now have a quarter of a million people living on this thing that flowed down, and the mountain has rebuilt itself, and so there is concern that this is happening again. Okay, I'd like to broaden the scope just a little bit, if you don't mind. The other, just the one other thing I want to do with the chalkboard here, uh, this is a divide. This is the drainage divide along the crest of the Cascades. And if I can erase creatively here without losing everything, I can uh, stress the importance of this divide in case you're starting to get nervous here in Ellensburg. <laughs> Volcanic mud flows follow river valleys. That's a blessing in a sense. We can predict where these flows will be traveling. They're not just going to go east. They don't have the energy to go up and over a ridge. They're going to follow an existing river valley. And so therefore, this divide is important. Because if we have Rainier, and even if we have a mud flow heading to the east from Mount Rainier, which we did with the Osceola, heading to the east, we are still west of the divide. And this mud flow is not going to be able to cross the crest and get over here. So. Our daddy long legs, you know what that is? Maybe that's a Midwestern thing. Our, 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 our spider with big legs. Even if we're flowing to the east, that's eventually getting to the Puget Sound. And do we have other cones in Washington? We do. We got Baker, we got Glacier Peak, we've got Adams, and we've got St. Helens. They also have volcanic mud flows. Daddy long legs coming away from the cone. They also have this hazardous story. But my point is, the crest of the Cascades is protecting us. And you go, well, wait a minute. I heard we actually have volcanic mud flow outside of Ellensburg. And we do. Take the old road along Yakima River to Cleellum, out by Thorpe, the Dudley Cliffs, White Rock. I'll show you a couple of photos if you don't know where I'm talking. Those are definitely mud flows. And yet somehow, I'm saying that mud flows are not coming to us today. They used to come to us. So I'll let the visuals help solve that problem. Ah, oh, no, let's do it now. Let's do it now. <laughs> that will get us into this, actually. That'll be a reason. Why do we have volcanic mud flows here now, when today we don't have a chance of a volcanic mud flow coming through? OK, I'm not going to erase carefully. I'm going to do it again. Put that divide in less carefully now. Here's Ellensburg, here's Seattle, here's Olympia, here's Tacoma, here is our precious mountain. Again, let's put in Glacier, excuse me, Glacier Peak, Baker, Rainier, Adams, St. Helens. The Cascades themselves have been around for 40 
million years. The Cascade Range, this corridor of volcanoes, has been around for 40. Four, let's write this down. I don't know why. You're not being tested, but let's write it down anyway. Okay? The Cascade Range has existed for 40 million years. Why do we even have volcanoes? I mean, there aren't volcanoes in New Jersey. There aren't volcanoes in Wisconsin. Why do we even have these beautiful cones? Thank God we've got them. They're gorgeous. The answer is there's an oceanic trench offshore, a drop off on the ocean floor offshore, and the ocean floor to the west of that trench is coming at us. Ocean floor off the coast of Washington is moving. It's moving inches a year, and it's moving towards us. And this ocean crust is diving under Washington at this oceanic trench. This is a cross-section of the same thing. It's the Juan de Fuca plate, not the Pacific plate. It's the Juan de Fuca plate that is subducting. This is the Juan de Fuca plate, it's underwater. This is the Juan de Fuca plate, it's underwater. It's subducting, it's generating large volumes of magma at the deep levels in the crust. That magma is rising, and the magma eventually gets to the surface and erupts. That's why we have these cones. I'm saying that we've had Juan de Fuca plate subduction and Juan de Fuca plate generated magma for 40 million years, and therefore we've had these volcanoes in this Cascade Corridor for 40 million years. However, I am not saying that Mount Rainier is 40 million years old. I know it sounds like I just did, but I didn't. Here it is again. The Cascades as a whole are 40 million years old. Individual cones have a short lifespan. Individual cone volcanoes have a 2 million year lifespan. This is still poorly understood why you develop a cone here 2 million years worth of eruptions and lahars and everything else, and then the volcano dies, and the magma chamber hardens, and the volcano literally gets erased, gets removed, and someplace else magma comes up from the subduction zone. 40 million years of volcanism, but we don't have 40 million years worth of individual cones. Instead, and you can now anticipate this, I think, that there are way more X's in here. This is tic-tac-toe if I've been drinking. <laughs> what do you suppose these X's are? That's right. Those are where the cones used to stand. Each X is a place where the cone used to stand. And you're like, I don't get it. Well, how do we even know where the, the cones aren't there? So how do we know they were even standing in a particular place? The answer is, even if you remove the magma, even if you shut off the supply of magma to a cone, and you stop the puff puffs of ash and steam and lava flows, even if you start physically eroding that mountain, there's still two pieces of evidence to prove that that cone used to exist. What's one way? One way is to hike into the goat rocks, hike into your favorite cascade area that's made out of granite. The granite is magma chamber rock. The granite is the result of sol uh, uh, kind of uh, freezing up that originally molten material in the magma chamber. Big blotches of granite, like the Snoqualmie batholith, are places that tell us where these cones used to stand. But there's another piece of field evidence. There are scraps. There are scraps of volcanic mud flow, or lahars, that are way older than 2 million years old. So here's stuff that's coming out of a volcano that, that far outlives the cone that made it. And that's the story with the volcanic mud flows, or the lahars, outside of Ellensburg. If you go to Thorpe and you find these lahars, and we will look at them, they are 10 million years old. The volcanic mud flows outside of Ellensburg are 10 million years old. Okay? Which volcano? Can't be one of the present ones, right? Why not? They're too young. They only last for 2 million years. So now we've got to find one of those X's that's 10 million years old, where we used to have a cone, and we have figured that out. That cone used to stand east of the divide in Bumping Lake between Yakima and White Pass. 
There's plutonic igneous rock up there that tells us exactly where that cone used to stand. And a river, these are volcanic mud flows that follow river valleys, a river used to flow from the Bumping Lake area to Thorpe. And that's impossible today because we have Menashtash Ridge and other ridges, but this is before those ridges grew. And so we have volcanic mud flow telling us where that old valley was to be. That's how we have volcanic mud flows here, but we don't face the prospect of volcanic mud coming to us at all in eastern Washington today. So how can you argue with a place like this? Micah Kippel taking some photos for us. Wonderful, wonderful, awe-inspiring, poetry-inspiring. How can you be blasé about these scenes? And this sentinel is presiding over much of the Pacific Northwest. As we well know, this is Tacoma, downtown Tacoma, looking up at this mountain. And uh, we got chatter in the room. You're all excited. That's good. Where is, oh, where is, where is that? I don't know. Where's that? I think I was there. Didn't you, did you take that one? Great. So if we get up, if I could take Jerry up to the mountain, uh, one key piece of evidence that this mountain is alive is the base of the glacial ice on Mount Rainier has been dealing with the heat coming off of the mountain like a radiator. So there's these wonderful caves carved by running water and steam and heat coming off the mountain. This is a steam cave or an ice cave that does not exist anymore because this particular glacier retreated. But if we get to the top, if we get to the top in the summit craters themselves, this is back in the 1890s and we have these little reports, these eyewitness reports of steam coming from these summit craters. So there's beautiful, circular, fresh as a daisy summit craters of Mount Rainier. That might be enough to convince Jerry if we could get him in a helicopter looking down on these beautiful, very fresh looking summit craters. And Gene Kiever from Eastern Washington did some exploration as well as Jack Powell from Ellensburg back in the 70s mapping many of those caves. Is this underground? We're at 14,410 feet above sea level on top of Mount Rainier with all these wonderful caves at the base of the glacier at the summit of Mount Rainier. Wonderful, so that's up high. Now, we know that if we have prevailing winds, which generally blow west to east, you know, us uh, folks in eastern Washington will be receiving and have received a brunt of this ash snowing out of the sky. We all can remember Mount St. Helens, but Rainier has done this as well. Here's Rainier Park, and each color is a distinctly identified tephra layer ash layer that has a specific chemistry and a specific date. And we've got many of these. You can dig pits like this at sunrise, which is a particular spot in Rainier Park. And these are just uh, textbooks, just reading the history of Rainier. And even some of these ashes are in Rainier, but they actually came from St. Helens. Beautiful layer cake geology, but just thousands of years instead of tens of millions like we normally do in lectures like these. If we are in eastern Washington and we are due east of the mountain, we can expect this ash. Now this is a, a publication long ago speculating on chances of getting ash coming out of the sky in the communities to the east of St. Helens. I'm not an emergency official. I'm not comfortable doing all sorts of predictions and probabilities. I'm pretty weak with stats anyway, so I prefer to just look at the past and make sure we understand how to interpret the past. These ash layers get finer as you get farther generally from the source. And uh, here we are in Ellensburg. Here's Yakima. Here's the mountain. So we're in for some interesting deposits coming down the road. Of course, the question is, what does down the road mean? Next Thursday? <laughs> next year? Next decade? Next century? A thousand years from now? We still cannot predict to that level of precision. Some of you know this in the Yakima River Canyon. We're two-thirds of the way down the canyon heading to Yakima, and there's some beautiful ash beds. You've noticed them, I'm sure, uh, on the west wall. For a long time, people thought those were from Mount Mazama, ash falling out of the sky from southern Oregon. Uh, we've done some relatively recent work on this, and the chemistry in the age does not look like it's Mount Mazama. And it could very well be Mount Rainier ash fall in Yakima Canyon. Still unsure exactly, and would love to solve that in the next 20 years if we can get somebody to work on that more carefully. Uh, broadening the scope to the Cascades, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between subduction of the Juan de Fuca Plate and this line of volcanoes, which is not just in Washington, of course, but goes from B.C. down to Northern California. 
And this is the connection. God, if we could somehow stop this Wanda Fuqua plate from subducting, we'd stop the magma generation, we'd stop these volcanoes, and we wouldn't have to worry about any action with Mount Rainier and volcanic mud flows coming down to Jerry's place in Enumclaw. But as long as that subduction continues, the magma continues as well, etc. This is an iconic plot from just the last 4,000 years. I gave you a dose of how much history we're really talking about with the Cascades as a whole, 40 million, and individual cones, 2 million, and Rainier being half a million. I don't know if I said that, but I'm saying it now. Rainier has been around for half a million years. But this is just the last 4,000 years. And looking at ash deposits and a few lahars to talk about potential interest. So again, to the beautiful mountain. I'm, I'm intrigued. There's all this buzz in the room. I'm very interested in your reaction here. I'm glad you're liking it. So uh, at least we can go up to Rainier and go, God, this is like a living museum. These are old growth stuff. We're inside the park boundary. There hasn't been any logging. It's kind of a living museum to what Washington was like botanically, even though I know nothing about plants. And we get up into the mountain. We've got all this wonderful glacial ice. Have you heard this? You take the amount of glacial ice on this mountain, it equals all the glacial ice on all the other 16 Cascade volcanoes together. This is a different scene. This is a monster. And worth our respect, of course. And we can approach the park from different spots. Many of us in Ellensburg drive up uh, 410, and we cross uh, uh, over at Chinook Pass. You know, maybe we're going to Paradise if we take another route, which is a famous place to visit on the south part of the mountain. And you take a little day hike with somebody who doesn't even walk very well, but you can get into these kinds of scenes with paved trails. Uh, you know, even the most uh, uh, inexperienced person out in the outdoors can have this kind of experience. Amazing. And that's why it's such a popular place, you know. Us locals don't go up there on a Saturday in July because we know it's going to be a zoo up there. <laughs> All right. I prefer sunrise. The crowds are slightly less, but still kind of zoo-like on occasion. But sunrise is important for our Osceola discussion tonight which we really haven't even sunk our teeth into yet, I might add. That's coming if you're feeling gypped at this point. So if you take a little day hike from sunrise, as I did with my wife a couple years ago, this is literally a, a two-hour hike from Sunrise Visitor Center, and you can get to a point pretty easily, I mean, we're in our 50s now, where you can pretty much be face-to-face -face with the mountain. And this is the face of the mountain that failed. It's the northeast face. So we're going to come back to this to make sure we can understand the significance of what we're looking at. But it's this northeast face of, of Mount Rainier that is the side that we want to talk about that failed catastrophically 5,600 years ago. This is from a webcam at Crystal Mountain. So we go back, this is impressive to me at least, we go back to the 1950s and 60s and 70s and there's all this wonderful work and all this uh, history put together and all these hazards figured out without the advantage of seeing Mount St. Helens erupt in 1980. I said that awkwardly, let me say it again. These guys did great work in the 1960s and 70s and figured out what the mud flows must have been like and the ash falls, etc. And then, after all this is published, they see Mount St. Helens essentially do what they were talking about decades earlier. So, my hat's off to all those wonderful USGS geologists who put these publications together. Here's a geologic map put out in the 1960s of Mount Rainier Park. These pink things are the andesite lava flows that are ending within the national park. We don't have Hawaiian lavas coming to Tacoma, right? No lava flows leaving the national park, essentially. But all this beautiful annotation of all these spots and the geologic significance, again, from these publications pre-1980. This is the White River that's going to be a key part of our Osceola story in just a second. I'm just giving you a sense of what's out there uh, produced by the United States Geological Survey before the St. Helens activity. So in a small group of geologists, they knew what the potential was for Rainier, and they knew that St. Helens would do something similar if St. Helens happened to go before Rainier, and of course it did. So this is what some of these publications look like, handed down to me from Don Ring, who was in the geology department for uh, 30 years. Look at these old photos and how precarious these layers are up on the flanks of Rainier. If I could take Jerry up there 
and talk about how rotten this rock is and the steepness of these angled slabs on the mountain, uh, maybe he'd be a little less confident about his statements. Uh, this is a volcanic mud flow from more than 2,000 years ago, not the Osceola, but this is a mapped deposit uh, that was uh, determined that the west flank failed and flowed. It's called the Round Pass mud flow, a little more than 2,000 years ago. And this is just a taste of the number of volcanic mud flows. Remember, there were 55 of these found, and I want to make sure I give credit to the guy who's done this work in just a second. His name is Dwight Crandall, and we'll get there, but I'm ahead of myself. So this is a spot that's very important. This is what this Osceola mud flow looks like. And what we've been doing recently is trying to get more attention to the actual deposit, because these old grainy black and white photos are probably not doing the trick. Before we do that, let's remind ourselves, and we've got a room full of people. Most of you are over 50. You all have stories of where you were on this morning. I wish we had time to listen to everybody's stories. We have time to listen to none of your stories tonight. <laughs> But at 8.32 on Sunday morning, May 18, 1980, we had a complete transformation of Mount St. Helens. Please don't be confused now. We've left Rainier for a bit, right? We've left Mount Rainier. This is Mount St. Helens, and we're at Mount St. Helens to uh, conceptualize what Rainier has done many times and use this as a parallel. So before the eruption of 1980, many in the geology world were assuming that St. Helens, when it did erupt, especially during those weeks of a buildup before the event, was assumed that it would be a vertical eruption. And in fact, there were even evacuation plans for homeowners around Mount St. Helens, and they drew concentric circles around the mountain. Said, if you're in the red, you're out. If you're in yellow, I guess you can come on the weekends. If you're green, whatever. But nobody ever was talking about a lateral or sideways blast. And unfortunately, that's what happened. That was the big surprise and the big learning lesson from Mount St. Helens. It erupted sideways. So this is a photo a week before the event. Most of the snow and ice that Jerry was talking about, he wasn't talking about St. Helens, but most of the snow and ice is gone. Magma has come up to shallow levels. And I'm sorry to report, this is the last evening of this gentleman's life. His name was David Johnston, a young geologist this is a Saturday evening. He's on a folding chair. He's working for the U.S. Geological Survey. He's full of optimism. By all accounts, a wonderful, generous, nice fellow. Somebody snapped this picture of him, and he was taking measurements between his ridge and the face of St. Helens. This is an old technique to keep measuring the distance using lasers to figure out how much that north face of St. Helens was growing. The tragedy is today, David would not have needed to be there. We have instruments that can do this without people involved. But he was there, three ridges to the north. Everybody agreed a safe spot. But again, this mountain blew sideways, and he was killed in the first few seconds after that explosion. He had enough time to radio in to his bosses in Vancouver Island, excuse me, in Vancouver, Washington, the home base of the USGS at the time. But... Um, he did not survive. And there's a Johnston Visitor Center and a Johnston Ridge named in, in David's honor. So these are the only photos we have of those first few seconds, taken by a camper 10 miles away, Gary Rosenquist. And uh, Gary sold these photos to, I think, Time Magazine or one of those big publications. And we don't have any video of those first few seconds that uh, claimed David's life. But the effect of that initial gas blast and the pyroclastic flow, of course, is profound. And are we talking about this with Rainier? We are. We're talking about all of these things at a much larger scale with Mount Rainier with thousands of eruptions over the last 500,000 years. We're still at St. Helens. We're realizing this is a thing. This is a big thing. This is 57 casualties. We are not minimizing this drama and this tragedy from Mount St. Helens. But again, we're taking a moment to realize that we can learn from St. Helens and help us better visualize what's to come with Mount Rainier. This is Ellensburg, downwind of St. Helens on a Sunday afternoon just after 12 o'clock noon. So much ash in the sky that the sky is dark. My 19-year-old students on campus usually gasp. They're like, oh my god, really? You all remember that, and we don't uh, need to go there further. The next morning, a little skiff of ash. This is ash, not snow, in May, about a quarter of an inch of ash. Ah, but do you remember it was more than the ash story with Mount St. Helens? 
with this face of St. Helens that did what? A landslide. It failed. We had a mud flow. We had a lahar come down the Tudel River. And so we even have a volcanic mud flow to study from Mount St. Helens. And these are photos in the weeks and months after that event in May of 1980. Again, Mount St. Helens, the Tudel River. Look at the size of these blocks being carried by this volcanic mud flow. Pieces of the cone, St. Helens' cone, carried downstream. The thickness of the mud, people walking around for scale. And this is a miniature version of a mud flow compared to the Osceola, as we will see soon enough. There's a hippie for scale. And there's the height of the mud coming down the valley. The Tootle River, major damage, volcanic mud flow in addition to everything else. Very good. So we go back to Mount Rainier and look at the possibilities in the future, but of course, looking primarily at the Osceola mud flow, which was a much larger event than what we just looked at. Yes, Mount Rainier is an active volcano. Wonderful, thank you. Now we decided with this new PBS series we have to make a five minute episode on this Osceola. And this will be act as a springboard for us to start looking very carefully at the Osceola mud flow. This is Chris Smart who works with me at Central, a gifted videographer and editor. We took a day last August. Well, yeah, you need a good day, right? You can't deal with Mount Rainier unless, you, unless you've got a bluebird day. And so we were out there filming down low, uh, up the river valley, the White River Valley where this mud flow came from. We found an exposure, thanks to some geologists tipping us off on where to find a good exposure of the Osceola mud flow. And then when we finally shared this, um, I was surprised at the reaction. A bunch of people said, look, that shot, you weren't actually up there. That was, you were in a TV studio, right? That was like a green screen, like that looked too perfect. I'm sure you weren't actually standing there. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. So I want to prove to you that we were up there. Here's Chris <laughs> at Tipsu Lake. All right, we got cars whizzing by. We got insects we're trying to deal with on a, whatever it was, a Friday morning. And uh, I, I really need to prove this to you. We're going to do... Bug. <laughs> Car noise, you hear it? Uh, wait, 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 let me get steady. Okay. This is easily the tallest mountain in all the Pacific Northwest, but it used to be taller by more than a thousand feet. I know it looks fake, but we were there, I promise. <laughs> why would, why would, look at this, we've got a bee. We, we wouldn't have a bee in a TV studio. We wouldn't bring in a bee. Where is this thing? Oh, there, look at that. All right. Let's look at this episode. This is Tacoma, Washington, and that is Mount Rainier, more than 40 miles away. Did you know that the bedrock beneath this city was created by that mountain? It's a volcano. An eruption sent volcanic mud high in the alpine zone down here to the blue waters of Puget Sound. What happened exactly? When did it happen? And will it happen again? This is the side of Rainier that failed, the east side. 5,600 years ago, the summit, which used to be 1,000 feet higher than today, and the east flank failed catastrophically and flowed all the way to Tacoma. So this is the White River. This is the path to Tacoma that the Osceola mud flow took. Can you picture this? Up to 500 feet of liquid cement from wall to wall, traveling up to 50 miles an hour, coming right down this river valley, picking up trees, rocks, anything in its path. There's a good 30 miles to go before we get to Puget Sound. The mud flow's rocks match the chemistry of Mount Rainier's rocks, proving that Rainier was the source. And when the Lahars reached the Puget Lowland, the mud spread out, making the bedrock of the Enumclaw Plain. Exposure of the Osceola mud flow is rare. 
There's too many trees here in western Washington, but this is a pretty good look at the internal structure of a lahar. See those boulders in that cliff? The boulders are scattered. There was no time for those boulders to settle out. This is a thing that flowed into place and is now solid bedrock. So for a long time, geologists thought maybe these were glacial deposits. But the perfect chemistry match and the internal structure, mud flow all the way. A rich history of Mount Rainier's eruptive past is recorded in volcanic deposits that surround the mountain. Today, more than 200,000 people live directly on the Osceola mud flow. Buried forests used to date the Osceola at 5,600 years ago now lie beneath sittings of towns that stretch from Mount Rainier all the way to the Puget Sound. Geologist Pat Pringle studies remarkably preserved timber buried by the ancient mud flows. These buried trees are like time capsules because they're, they're preserved so well. When you do find a, a buried tree with the bark on it, and if the tree has a lot of annual growth rings in it, well that is an opportunity to use a, a good technique called wiggle match radiocarbon dating with this wiggling decay curve from radiocarbon and the computer software helps you match it up to the best possible fit. And that really allows you to get within a decade or two uh, of the actual date of the event, the actual calendar date sometimes. Forecasting the next eruption remains elusive, but the science continues and geologists have determined that this will happen again. The west flank of Rainier looks most likely to fail next, sending volcanic mud flow all the way to Puget Sound. And even though it may be decades or even centuries before the mountain erupts, the concern is real. So that's the work of Chris Smart. And I want to make sure you also know that Linda Schockler was involved in writing those programs with me. So thanks to those guys for helping put that together. So there's archaeological finds at the base of that Osceola mud flow, proving that Native Americans were in those valleys on that fateful day. Uh, so we can weave in Native American history somehow. That's always a weakness of mine, but I'm interested in trying to compile some of those oral traditions. This is where we were to look at the internal structure of that Osceola flow, and I want to make sure that we give credit to this gentleman, Dwight Crandall. Nickname, Rocky. Rocky Crandall. And you're going to meet him through an old uh, interview here in just a second. I wish he was still around. We would have interviewed him for the program. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. He's one of these rare individuals who took deposits that everybody just kind of shrugged their shoulders on and saw something completely differently. And I'll let him speak for himself on how he came up with this idea that, my God, this is actually something that flowed from Mount Rainier as opposed to something from a glacier. Rocky Crandall began to answer this question quite unexpectedly during a study that began some 30 miles from the mountain on the edge of the Puget Sound lowland. I was just out of graduate school in the early 1950s and uh, I was assigned by the Geological Survey to make a geological map of an area east of Tacoma, Washington. Working from older maps, Crandall expected to find the hummocky remains of glacial deposits around the towns of Buckley and Enumclaw. When he arrived, he found only a flat plain. Where he expected to find glacial sediments plastered on the hills, they seemed to occur only in the valleys. As Crandall attempted to explain how the valley floor had formed, he found himself moving in a surprising direction and toward a stunning conclusion. And I came up with the idea that perhaps it had actually flowed into place like a giant mud flow. And it was just like a light going on over my head because everything I knew about the deposit fit this kind of an origin, that it actually had flowed into place. It had not been formed by a glacier at all. But the question in my mind is, if it is a mud flow, how, 
How did it ever get started? Where did it come from? And I had no idea at all. Even though standing there on the plain that was formed by this mud flow, I could see Mount Rainier in the distance, and uh, I didn't make the connection for a long time. As Crandall searched vainly for the source of this giant mud flow, known as the Osceola, its deposits led him up the White River to a point 10,000 feet up the northeast side of Mount Rainier. We could hardly believe our eyes when we actually found a remnant of the same deposit there at the tip of Steamboat Prow. As he stood on Steamboat Prow looking toward the summit, Crandall realized that the Osceola could have come only from the sudden collapse of a major segment of the mountain. This was a radical idea. Such massive volcanic landslides were virtually unknown. So I promised that we would find some key features on the face of Mount Rainier, right? And this is one. I'm not a mountaineer. I've never been to the top of Rainier. Some of you in this room have many times. But Steamboat Prow is a key spot for us. It's a portion of this former slope of Rainier that did not fail. Everything collapsed around it. But this Steamboat Prow is one of these former flanks that we can still see. So here's Liz hiking out of sunrise, a simple day hike. There's that Steamboat Prow. Can you imagine just walking up this former slope of Rainier when Rainier used to be higher? That's Steamboat Prow and its significance. Can we find it again? Steamboat Prow, where's this part of the mountain? It failed. That's the Osceola that flowed to Tacoma. Where's Steamboat Prow? It's here. What's next door? Missing rock. Rock that should be there but slumped. Landslide down to Tacoma. Check this out, by the way. This is the top of Goat Island Mountain. There are Osceola mudflow deposits on top of that mountain. How do you get stuff up there? you have enough material slide that you have some run-up. You have some Osceola mud flow work its way up slope and splash some mud flow essentially up on top of that neighboring mountain, most of it heading to Puget Sound. So this is from NASA. I have no idea how they do this, but we're going to zoom in here if I can get this to work. Sorry, I'm going to start it again. I think I'm going to start it again. Oh, my God. What's going on? Great. So let's test your knowledge here. Mountaineers know what side of the mountain we're looking at on already. This is approaching Mount Rainier. We can see the summer craters, right? We can see all the glacial ice. We're on the southeast side. Was that your guess? We're looking on the southeast side. This is not a side that failed with Osceola. There were certainly older mud flows and older landslides, but let's come around now. Thank you, NASA. Again, I got no idea how this works. But we're going to work our way to the northeast side. That's the side we want with the Osceola. Little Tahoma Peak, I believe, a former slope. Used to, mountain used to be higher. Can you find Steamboat Prow now? Right? So we've got one flank, another flank, the remnants of the old mountain, and then we can see how much is gone. Pretty impressive, huh? So the scars are in the mountain. Steamboat Prow, Little Tahoma, and the Osceola down. You've got it by now. You've got it by now. So I've got another couple video clips. I think they're crucial to visualizing this. This is, again, from that Rocky Crandall VHS tape. It was literally VHS tape. It's out of print now. It's called Perilous Beauty. But they did a nice job. This is a simulation of what we're trying to visualize to eventually make Steamboat Prow and that other flank. Osceola. We now know that the entire summit and northeast face of Mount Rainier fell away suddenly in an immense landslide accompanied by volcanic explosions. The landslide became a mud flow that filled the White River Canyon with up to 600 feet of rock, clay, water, and ice. This cement-like slurry thundered down the valley at speeds up to 50 miles per hour. As the flow left the mountains, it spread out to form the Enumclaw Plain that had led to Rocky Crandall's original insight. Finally, the Osceola disappeared into Puget Sound. 
It is difficult to grasp the destructive force of one of these massive mud flows. But try to imagine a towering wall of mud and rock crashing through a canyon at 50 miles per hour, destroying everything in its path. These much smaller modern examples, about five to 10 feet deep, provide only a hint of the ferocity of Mount Rainier's major mud flows. Even the giant mud flow produced by the 1980 Mount St. Helens landslide was small compared to the Osceola. The massive Osceola collapse, which occurred about 5,600 years ago, destroyed the top of Mount Rainier, lowering it by as much as 1,000 feet. But this destruction set the stage for new growth. The mountain began to rebuild soon after the Osceola event. Thick, slow-moving lava oozed out into the crater, building a new summit cone. Got it. I don't know why they chose that music. Okay, good. Let's keep rolling. So there's the scar. It's just a big horseshoe football stadium like the Ohio State football stadium. If you look for it, you can see it. A big open horseshoe with the open end where the landslide took place. You can see it on all these geologic maps from the summit of Rainier. Now we know what we're looking at. The old scar and then the younger than 5,600 year old lavas underneath that ice that rebuilt the cone. So to Pat Pringle, the guy you met briefly with the tree stuff, uh, and looking at maps now, hazard maps, and this is coming right out. I have a couple recommendations for you. This is a beautifully written uh, roadside geology guide of Mount Rainier. You can get it off the internet for free. Download the whole thing as a PDF if you're able to do that. Or you can send off to the Washington Department of Natural Resources and get an old school uh, uh, spiral bound guy with all these beautiful maps and road legs and road guides. So Pat Pringle, a long history with uh, uh, volcanic study in the Northwest, has been a, a proponent to publicize and make this story available to the public. So thanks to Pat for that. There's also a brand new book that came out last year called Geology Underfoot in Western Washington. Dave Tucker is a geologist up in the Bellingham area. He has a chapter on the Osceola mud flow as well. So in Ording, we look up to the mountain. We realize now we need to go through the White River Valley if we're going to look for evidence of this Osceola event. Remember, hundreds of feet, up to 500 feet of mud that's wall to wall in this canyon that came down. And of course, at the end of the line are a lot of people. Tacoma, Enumclaw, Buckley. Do you have relatives? Do you have friends? Uh, how nervous should we be? That's not our emphasis tonight. I don't have good ways of talking about the future, but I can talk about the past. That's for damn sure. We've got all these general publications that have all these beautiful maps, and they all basically have a map that looks like this. This is a classic look. So here's Mount Rainier. Here's Tacoma. And the black are areas where major mud flows have traveled in the past. This is our friend, the Osceola, down the white, spreading out. Remember that animation? Spreading out to literally bury a former landscape. If you were with us four Wednesday nights ago, we were talking about flood basalts in eastern Washington, remember? Burying a rugged landscape. That's true here as well. The Enumclaw Plain is a plain because of there's so much of this volcanic material, this mud flow, that buried that landscape. But there are other valleys as well. The Nisqually, the Puyallup, that also have lahars in them and potential lahars in the future. So yeah, when you drive I-5 Fort Lewis over to Tacoma and you go through that wildlife refuge, that's the Nisqually drainage. There's mud flows from Mount Rainier in that thing as well. So these are the classic shots then of this Enumclaw Plain, this area that was buried by, by not lava, but volcanic mud flow or lahar. And uh, a couple twists on this if you're getting bored. The Osceola did not have as far to travel to get to the Puget Sound as it does today. Here's what I mean. This is 5,600 years ago and this is today. And if you look carefully at this, you can see that Tacoma and Puyallup are land now, but they were open water 5,600 years ago. In other words, when the Osceola came down, it actually 
built land. It actually filled in some areas that had Puget Sound water. And so it's not an overstatement to say that the rock beneath Tacoma is Osceola mudflow. There would be no land there if it wasn't for the Osceola filling some of those paleo valleys. And this is a better diagram without color to show some of this Osceola mudflow material pushing its way out into the water. There's a whole river story. I don't know if you've ever occurred to you. The Green River actually changes its name and becomes the Duwamish. <laughs> and there's engineering to change these rivers. The river thing I've never totally figured out, but the Lahars rearranged the rivers a little bit as well. This is from a classic book that's out of print called Cascadia by Bates McKee from the UW back in the early 70s. But the point is, these maps are all over the place telling the basic story about hazards with lahars. But remember, it's not just Rainier. There is a similar volcanic lahar map for Mount Baker up by Bellingham. And the risk of future lahars coming down the Nooksack to Bellingham Bay and down the Skagit River to Mount Vernon and Cedro Woolley. The uh, Glacier Peak, which is a remote Cascade volcano, but still active. And the potential for volcanic mud flows coming down, again, the Skagit and the Stille. The Mount Adams scene has volcanic mud flows that have been mapped and coming down those drainages. And of course, Mount St. Helens with the Toodle River. Every one of the Cascade volcanoes in the Northwest, including Oregon and Northern California, has this volcanic mud flow story. Rainier has certainly not cornered the market. But this is the original. This is Dwight Rocky Crandall making these maps with not only the Osceola, but the Electron mud flow and the Paradise mud flow. And he was way ahead of his time, mapping these things out long before people really understood the role and the significance and, of course, the danger of these volcanic mud flows. If you're curious, if you have a friend who lives in Buckley or Ording, and uh, they hear or they see on Twitter or something that Rainier is starting to erupt in a big way, how much time do they have to get out of Ording, let's say? Uh, there's lots of factors involved, but there are drills, of course, to evacuate people as best you can, and you just want to get people on high ground as much as you possibly can. And so in Ording, the general rule of thumb, as I understand it, is you got about an hour. Rainier starts a major landslide that's going to convert to a mud flow. Let's say it's coming down the Puyallup River. You've got about an hour before that mud flow is going to arrive in Ording. You've got an hour and a half before it gets to Puyallup. You got maybe two hours before it arrives in downtown Tacoma. That's if it's a major event. That's if, if, if. There's lots of ifs. But that's the kind of timing we're talking about. And you go, well, gee, I don't know. I think I could get out of a valley in, in an hour. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's a few neighbors as well. Right. Good. So there are evacuation routes, just like there are tsunami evacuation routes on the Washington coast. Um, we have a ways to go before we can really get ourselves educated, number one, and then drilled appropriately. Remember now, oh, I'm hearing a murmur again. You recognize this. This is close to home. This is just outside of Ellensburg. The Dudley Cliffs. These are volcanic mud flows. Oh, my God, should we be worried? No. Do you remember? We have the Cascade Crest now to protect us. This is Mount Rainier, the cone today, the topic of our discussion tonight. Just outside of the park, over in the Bumping Lake area, there is granite rock. This is the old magma chamber for what? A 10 million year old volcano that was standing right here that sent a volcanic mud flow down the Bumping River that eventually went to Thorpe. Remember? Extinct, gone, active here. We don't have to worry. We do not have to worry. I repeat, we do not have to worry. There's plenty of things to worry about, not about this in Ellensburg. This is from a video program long ago, just to give you a taste. Those familiar mountains have been standing for less than two million years. And these Thorpe Lahars are 10 million years old. That means we have deposits here that have long outlived their source. Careful research by field geologists have concluded that the old cone-shaped volcano that erupted 10 million years ago to make these deposits once stood between Yakima and White Pass. And our lahars flowed down river valleys 
that once connected that area with Thorpe. So there's even effects of lahars with petrified wood. Now we're at Vantage and petrified wood at that park. The petrified wood has been pulled out of a zone, a bed, that's 15 million years old. And the question mark is, why are there so many different kinds of petrified logs, different kinds of tree species, all together? Why do you have a sweet gum next to a cypress, next to an oak, next to a ginkgo, next to a whatever? And the thought is, the working model is, volcanic mud flows from a cone in the Cascades 15 million years old picked up trees along the way and brought them all and dumped them in the vantage area to be petrified by the next Columbia River basalt lava. So even out here in eastern Washington, far away from the Cascades, there's a potential Cascade source with the lahars that flowed to the east, again, when the cones were a little bit closer to Vantage. To wrap up, we're going to go to the west flank of Rainier and try to look at why we think the west flank of Rainier might be the next uh, uh, flank to fail. The rocks are steeply dipping, but that's not news. We know there's steeply dipping layers all around the mountain. But there's something else on the west flank that's a little bit unnerving. Let's take a look. Mount Rainier is weakened even further by hydrothermal alteration, a process that turns solid rock into soft and slippery clay. Atop the end of the Tahoma Glacier, in a landscape of altered rock, the smell of sulfur taints the air. Boulders fall apart. Iron minerals crust the rock like rust. Slippery clay minerals coat the volcanic debris. Will it be the west flank that goes next? It's a little unclear. Many think that's true. I personally take solace that there are very smart people who are working on these mountains and have new techniques to monitor activity. And I don't think this is going to take us by surprise. We'll probably have plenty of weeks of early warning. I hope this is the case before the next major event. Here's a taste of the new techniques that help us monitor the activity in these cones. One of the things moving magma tends to do is it tends to deform the surface of the earth. It tends to uh, cause the surface to bulge upward or to spread apart. One of the instruments we use to measure deformation is a tilt meter. A tilt meter measures very subtle changes in the surface of the earth as magma accumulates beneath the station or moves upward, for example. Another instrument we use is the Global Positioning System, or GPS. So we put several of them out on the volcano, we record signals from satellites orbiting above the Earth, and we look for movement of one of the stations with respect to the other. As the ground deforms, the volcano changes its shape, those stations move, and that tells us something about what's going on beneath the surface. Dan Jerishan, among many other at the Cascade Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, doing great work. So Mount St. Helens, we learned some lessons from that. Mount Rainier, we know that's there. The future is the question mark, but we've learned much from the past. Will it truly be the west flank of the mountain that fails next? And will that mud flow come down the Nisqually, excuse me, come down the Puyallup River and head directly to Ording? This is maybe the best portrayal I've seen, the book cover of this new book from Dave Tucker, showing perhaps a scenario for Rainier in the future, hopefully decades and decades down the road, the west flank, the Lahar coming down, the Puyallup River over Ording, and coming down to Tacoma and I-5. That's a question mark, but we've learned lots, and there'll be much more to learn coming down the road. Hey, thanks for coming tonight, and thanks for coming to all these. I appreciate it. Thank you.